Hello, my name is Andrew Hernandez. I want to welcome you to Emmanuel Church's online worship service. Could you take a moment right now and share this video with those you know? You can do that by clicking the share button. Thanks for spreading the word. Part of our worship is the giving of our tithes and offerings. In Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. You can learn more and give at erc.la forward slash give. Our call to worship today says, let us worship God. He is our refuge and our fortress, our God, in whom we trust. Let us proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us call upon our true God, believing him in our hearts, confessing him with our mouths and worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Let's worship together. Good morning, we just welcome you into worship with us. God, we are just glad in you. We're glad to be able to worship you, receive our worship, receive our praise this morning.
First Peter chapter one, verse 21 says, through Christ you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Let's continue worshiping our risen savior this morning. The gospel of Jesus, it's the hope of the ages, burning brighter and brighter, and standing forever. The church he is building, nothing can stop it. It's a city that's shining, a light in the darkness. Nothing can stop it Though Christ was dead Now surely he's risen Yeah, he's coming back again And Christ will reign in trust
future. So Lord, all the praise belongs to you, God. We just worship you, God. We thank you for all that you've done. We ask that you go before this time, Lord. Speak to us through your word. We love you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, my name is Johnny Tamayo. I'm one of the pastors here at Emmanuel, and I'm so grateful to be able to spend some time with you today and share God's word. I have a question, and right there at home you can ask yourself, do you have a friend or a family member who just likes to one-up you? You tell them something really cool that happened to you, and they just have a really cooler, uh, more cooler story just to share with you. Let's say I tell my friends, hey, you know what? I just found five bucks on the street, and I feel so good about that because now I can buy some Starbucks. And then your friend tells you, oh, guess what? That's cool, but I just found 20 bucks and a Starbucks gift card. And then when I went through the drive-thru, someone paid it forward, so I even had a lot more stuff going on than you. That's not, that's not very fun, right? Or you tell them, um, guess what? I got accepted into seminary. I'm so excited, so cool. And your friend will tell you, oh, that's cool. I got two bachelors, I got a master's, and I'm currently working on my PhD. So that's nice for you. That's not very fun, right? Well, today, I would like to be that friend to you. But instead of trying to one-up you, with my personal accomplishments, I wanna do it with one simple statement, and that is, Christ is better. You just got a new job, that's great, but Christ is better. You got accepted into your dream school, that's good, but Christ is better. Now by this, I don't mean that we should not strive to do better, that we should not uh, try to better ourselves. No, we should give thanks to God for all the blessings that he gives us, right? We give God to all the blessings because all blessings flow from him. But what I mean is that no amount of money, no privilege, no achievements are actually going to save us. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing humanly possible that we can do to actually be made right in the eyes of God. God has provided a way for us to be saved and it's Jesus. That is why Jesus Christ is better. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. All right, if you don't believe me, listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3. Now we're gonna do this a little bit different this time around. Uh, we're not gonna have the words on the screen, so I'm just gonna ask you to, if you want, close your eyes and just meditate and listen uh, to the word of the Lord. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're going to spend some time breaking down verses 2 and 4 that we just read. And we're going to answer a couple of questions. First, we're going to take a look at Paul's word of warning. He says, watch out. And then we're going to answer some questions. Who are we? How do we serve? And who do we trust? All right, so let's jump right in. What is Paul's word of warning? In verse 2, he says, Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, and those mutilators of the flesh. Now, 
These sound like very harsh words, but the Apostle Paul here was not trying to be mean. He was just not trying to call names just to call names. He was actually uh, carefully chose those terms to uh, achieve intense irony. And you're going to see how we're going to contrast it with the descriptions of God's people in verse 3. So Paul warns the Philippians to be on guard, to watch out, because there are people that are going to come and are going to try to distort and change the gospel. They're going to try to add things that are not there, that are not requirements anymore. And in uh, the time of the Philippians and the time of the Galatians, there was a group of people called the Judaizers. And uh, that term, yeah, it just means to live according to Jewish customs. So the Judaizers taught that if you wanted to be a Christian, if you actually wanted to be saved, you had to become a Jew first. And with that, you had to be circumcised. So if you wanted to get to Christ, if you wanted to be saved, if you truly wanted to be called a Christian, you had to be a Jew first. It's like me telling you, if you want to be a true member of Emmanuel Reformed Church, you have to put your faith in Christ, but you also have to be a Dodgers fan. There's not one or the other. You have to be, uh, put your faith in Christ and be a Dodgers fan. And we know that it doesn't work like that. To add anything to the work of Christ is to belittle God's grace. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, not returning to the law. Listen to how the Apostle Paul puts it. He says, a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So why is this warning important for us today? Why should we be on guard and why should we watch out? Well, there are people who are going to come and try to distort the gospel as well. This is uh, not something that just happened before. This is something that happens today as well. In Colossians 2.8, the Apostle Paul says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So put your mind on Christ focus on Christ and watch out because there are people who are going to come and try to change that through human philosophy. Now, having a superficial knowledge of God is not helpful for us because if you only know God in a certain way, that's the only thing that you're going to think about God and it's going to actually affect the way that you live and the way that you worship. Let's say you only know God as a judge. What happens to our lives when we think of God as just a judge. Well, we're going to be really scared. We're going to be thinking that lightning is going to strike us down whenever we sin, whenever we mess up. We're going to live so scared that to actually live our, our lives joyfully here. We're going to be so scared to move around or do anything because when we sin, God is just going to judge us. Now, what happens when we think of God as just grace? God is grace, but what happens when we think of God as just grace? Well, we're going to do whatever we want because at the end of the day, when we're in our deathbed, we're just going to say, God, please forgive me. And we're going to expect that God is going to forgive us. And we can't fool God like that. We know it doesn't work that way. So we need a knowledge of God. We need to know who God is. Now, some people may argue, yeah, that makes sense. But no, I don't really need to learn anything about God. I don't need to know anything about God. I'm content with just having a relationship with Jesus. As long as I feel Jesus in my heart and I feel good when I come to church and I feel good when I sing worship songs, and that's all I need because I know that Jesus is in my heart. Now that sounds really nice, but it's a half true. And we all really need to know God. The um, uh, late theologian R.C. Sproul says, theology, the study of who God is, is unavoidable for every Christian. It's our attempt to understand the truth that God has revealed to us, something that every Christian does. So it is not a question of whether we're going to engage in theology. It's a question of whether our theology is sound or unsound. So it's important to study and learn because God has taken great pains to reveal himself to his people. He gave us a book, one that is, meant to, that is not meant to sit on a shelf pressing dried flowers, but to be read, searched, 
digested, studied, and chiefly to be understood. So the study of God is something that we all do and we all should strive to do. We should strive to get to know better so that we can worship better as well. Now, it's easy for us to stand guard and to watch out when thoughts uh, really outside of Christianity come our way. If you tell me about karma, I'm going to be like, no, I don't believe that. That's not in the Bible. Get out of here. Manifesting? Psh, get out of here. Red flag. Jesus is not God? Get away from me. I know that's not true because the Bible says otherwise. But it gets to be really hard when thoughts within Christianity come, like the Judaizer threat, and try and distort and change things around like a little bit of God's grace and a little bit of your effort saves you. And then that's how you become justified. Remember that word that Pastor Clark talked about? That gets to be a lot more tricky to figure out what's right and what's wrong, what's sound and what's unsound, right? I'll tell you one of my proudest moments uh, as a youth pastor. I was leading the Spanish youth group about four years ago, and we invited a youth group uh, from um, outside the city to come and hang out with us. Um, they were a group that wanted to know how we were doing things, what we were teaching, and just uh, have fellowship with us. So I invited them over and I told the leader, hey, why don't you give the talk? Send me your notes uh, just so I can give them a quick read so I can prepare uh, and my leaders as well so we can have a good conversation and also to check <laughs> what they were teaching because we weren't, uh, we didn't know each other too well, but we wanted to fellowship. So this, this person sent me their notes and it was great. I was so excited for the message. And when it got down to the actual talk, I don't know what happened, if the leader got nervous or I, I just don't know what happened. Uh, but this person started saying some things that were not very biblical and were not very true to, to what we teach. Um, and I was surprised because I, I noticed it, but then some of the students started looking to, at each other and turning around and looking at me and saying like, what's going on? Like, that's not true. That's not what we talked about here last week. And I was very proud because I'm like, all right, I thought these kids weren't listening and they're actually paying attention. They're getting to know who God is. So that's really, really cool. And it's important to know who God is because what we believe about God, salvation, ourselves should not just be head knowledge, just for up here, just knowledge for the sake of having knowledge. What we know and believe about God through the word actually helps us to worship God better. So we can't separate our theology, our study of God with our doxology, with how we worship God. That's very important. Both help each other out and complement each other. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had our worship team meeting and we're reading a book together called Corporate Worship. And we're just trying to learn more about God. We're trying to get in the word and help our church worship as a whole. And our worship leader, Rachel, uh, she prayed something that stuck with me. And it was so important. She said, God, whatever we learn here today, please let it not be for the sake of just being right, but so that we can worship you faithfully. And that's what it's all about. When we get to know God, we can worship faithfully. We can worship in the spirit. So if we try our best to learn about God, then that will also help us understand who we are in light of who God is, how we're called to worship and why Christ is better than any of our human efforts. So who are we? We are God's people. The apostle Paul says, watch out for those dogs. And then in verse, t, verse 3, he says, For it is we who are the circumcision. We are God's people. So Paul calls the Judaizers dogs because the term had a religious meaning to it. Under the old covenant, circumcision was instituted by God in Genesis 17 as one of the deeds that showed that Israel belonged to God. It was a physical procedure that served as God, God's visible mark on them, like they are my people. Now the Jews referred to the Gentiles as dogs because they were outside of the covenant community. They didn't belong to God's people at that time and they were considered unclean or uncircumcised. Now the Apostle Paul says that anyone who puts their faith in Christ are now the true people of God because of the work of Christ. And now he says that the Judaizers are now the dogs. Wow, that changed a lot. The Judaizers were unwilling to recognize that with the coming of the gospel, 
The literal observance of this rite had been made unnecessary. Christ had come to fulfill the law. The Judaizers were placing their value in their lineage, in their status, and their tradition over Christ. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So Christ did what we could not do. Christ being fully God, fulfilled the law and made us right with God. So we are God's people not by what we do, whatever tradition we come from, or whatever ritual we do every week, but by the work of Christ and what he has done for us. It's really interesting to me that Paul says, it is we who are the circumcision. We, me and you. Now, Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Circumcised on the eighth day. And the Philippians, the people in Philippi, were all mostly uncircumcised Gentiles. So now what is the common ground between those two vastly different groups of people? It's not how they were brought up, but it was Christ and their commitment to the gospel. In Galatians 3, 26 says, So it is Christ, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there is male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So the people of God are brought together by Christ, not by their status, their privilege, the color of skin, politics, or anything else. I came to the U.S. as an immigrant at the age of 11. Now from 11 to about 21, 22, it was pretty rough for me. I, I got here in sixth grade. I didn't know a word of English. And if you know sixth grade, that's like peak bullying years. Uh, when, my, when, when, when friends were reading Harry Potter, like really big books, um, I was reading at a second grade, first, second grade level, and I was reading Clifford, the Big Red Dog. So I would get made fun of a lot for that. When I was 16, I had friends who were getting their driver's license, and I couldn't do that. I didn't have money to afford other things or cars, and it was, it was pretty rough for me. And I was getting made fun of for a lot. And I was the only Christian in my group. So that was also set me out as an outcast. When I got older, I realized that there might be some places where I don't belong in the city. And the only pl place where I felt like I truly belong, like I truly, where I truly felt a part of the community was in the church. Because in the church, I felt loved. My family felt cared for. I could be with a group of people who believed the same things that I did. The church is the place where God gathers rich, poor, old, young, and all backgrounds and contexts for the purpose of worshiping Him. Now in seminary too, I'm almost uh, finished with my seminary journey, but when I started, I was really anxious because I'm going to a seminary in Holland, Michigan. Now what is this kid that is Mexican from Southern California going to be doing at a seminary in Holland, Michigan? I was definitely going to be an outcast and I was not going to fit in. But when I got there, they were all so welcoming and loving. And people who are twice as tall than me and are very different than me, that come from very different contexts, embraced me and took me as one of their own. Now I'm friends with someone like Pat, who <laughs> we have nothing in common outside of the gospel, outside of the Christ, the work that Christ has done in all of us, but we're so vastly different yet so united and we can be true friends. So Christ is better because the only requirement to be accepted as the people of God is to trust Jesus and proclaim that He is Lord. So how do we serve? We serve by God's Spirit. The Apostle Paul says, watch out for those evildoers. And then he says, we serve God by His Spirit. So God's people, united in Christ, serve and worship God by His Spirit. Paul calls the Judaizers evildoers because they were putting an unnecessary value on their rituals and on their traditions. Now in Acts 15, the elders and the apostles got together to talk about this Judaizer issue. In verse 6, they say it says, The apostles and elders met to consider this question. 
After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. He said, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. So the outpouring of the Spirit was the, over the Gentiles was more than enough proof for the apostles and the elders to welcome them as God's people. Circumcision was a sign that pointed to something greater, to God's promise. Now, baptism is the counterpart to circumcision in the New Covenant and is the sign and seal of the New Covenant in Christ. But even then, that sign points to something even greater. So being splashed with water is meaningless if it's not accompanied by a life that is lived in the Spirit and points to Christ. When Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can someone be born again? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and Spirit. So going through the Christian motions without the Spirit is meaningless in the same way that circumcision without the true relationship with God was meaningless. So it doesn't matter how loud we sing in church, how many days a week we volunteer, if we're born into a Christian home, how long we've been a believer. If our hearts and motives are not in the right place, that is walking in step with the Spirit, those things are worthless. The Apostle Paul says we actually become evildoers. So how can we tell that we are actually worshiping God in the Spirit, that we are serving God in the Spirit? I believe it's by the fruit that we bear. Now, I'm not very good at telling trees apart from each other. I didn't know I had a pom pomegranate tree in my backyard until I saw the pomegranates come out. But it's the fruit that we bear that helps us to see who we are in Christ. In the Trinity, the primary job of the Spirit is actually to make much of Christ. The Holy Spirit says, don't look at me, look at Christ. Now, you can ask yourself the same thing when you're in church, when you're at work, when you're in school, in your family, in your life. Am I, making, am I making things about myself or am I making things about Christ? I have to have a personal check-in with myself every time I'm going to come and serve at church. Every time I walk through the gates of the parking lot, whether it is for a worship practice, for a Sunday service, for youth, for whatever it is that I'm doing, I have to tell myself, you're doing this for Christ. Worship in the Spirit. Don't look to yourself. Don't make this about yourself. Because under the lights with my guitar, it can be pretty easy for me to say, all right, everyone thinks I'm cool, but that's not what I want. And I have to pray every single time I walk through those gates and say, God, help me to make this about Christ and not about myself. Now, when I make things about Christ and not about myself, something happens in my heart. I change and I'm actually going to want to care for others. In Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So this freedom we have is not just to do our own thing and to say, look at me, but it's to love Christ and to point others to Christ and to love them as ourselves. So the people of God are those whose faith is placed in Christ, whose lives are spirit-led and bear fruit that is visible and tangible. And Christ is better because Christ allows us to do those things. It is the work, the saving work of Christ that allows us to do that. Lastly, the people of God are those who live life knowing that Christ is better than any human accomplishment or privilege. So who do we trust? We trust Christ of our flesh. He says, watch out for those mutilators of the flesh. We boast in Christ and we put not confidence in the flesh. So again, Paul calls them mutilators of the flesh, even a harsher term, because they were placing that value in that ritual. And the ritual by himself, by itself, would not get them anything. So the Judaizers valued their tradition and their privilege over Christ. And Paul says that the true people of God actually boast 
in Christ Jesus and not in what they do for themselves, not in their own intellect or their own privilege. So in the next verses, Paul kind of shares his testimony, not his conversion story, but he kind of tells us, this is what I valued before Christ when I was focusing on myself, and this is what I value now that I know Christ. He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Basically, I was born in the right place at the right time. Like, I got it made. And then he tells us his accomplishments. Man, in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. I was pretty good. As for seal, persecuting the church, I actually believed, truly believed, what, uh, who God was at the time so that I could actually do something about it and persecute the church. And as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. Basically, if anyone is going to get saved here through human work, it's going to be me. I got it made. But then he says, I met Christ. And whatever were gains to me, I not consider loss for the sake of Christ. So Paul's encounter with Jesus changed the way that he understood life and what needed to be his priority. So Paul is not saying that the flesh in itself is evil. Paul is not saying that his heritage, his upbringing, and his accomplishments are evil. Paul is saying that trust and reliance on those things rather than in the gospel is what is wrong. But Jesus encountered Paul on the road and put things to perspective. The things that he once counted as what would save him were actually now trash. They were not helpful. Paul realized that all those things were not going to get him to be saved. They were not going to make him right with God. Those things weren't bad, but they weren't good because they weren't Christ. Does that make sense? Let's say I want to get better at soccer, but then I start doing a bunch of basketball drills. Is that going to help me get better at soccer? No. Is playing basketball bad? No. Playing basketball is great, but it's not going to get me better, any better at soccer. So I have to do, Paul says, what is right, and that is to follow Christ because I want to be saved. So what is the most valuable thing to, thing to the Apostle Paul now? It's actually to know Christ. In verse 8, he says, The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Verse 10 says, I want to know Christ. So to know Christ is not just to know historical facts, just head knowledge about the person of Jesus. To know, to know Christ is to acknowledge Him as the Savior of our lives, as our Lord, in every area of our lives, in our doubts, in our fears, and in our celebrations. And to also be able or to want to participate in the sufferings. This is where people tune out, so please don't tune out. This is very important. You want to know the power of Christ's resurrections, you also have to participate in His sufferings. There's no other way around it. And the Christian life is going to be tough because we are to become like Christ in His death, right? Die to ourselves. But guess what? It's totally worth it because one day we will get to know the power of His resurrection. And today, we are assured that God is with us. So we have a choice to make. We either boast in Christ Jesus or put our confidence in the flesh. We either acknowledge that God sent Christ to die for our sins and live through the Spirit's help in a way that reflects that Christ is Lord, or we put our confidence in ourselves, in our human efforts, in our privilege, in our status, and live our lives trying to attain something that is unattainable. So when you get to heaven, you will stand before God, and you will either be dressed in your righteousness or in Christ's righteousness. Which would you prefer? Speaking strictly for myself, I would much rather prefer Christ's righteousness because mine is not very good. It does not measure up to the standards that God desires. So I would much rather be dressed in Christ's righteousness. And if we believe in God's work for our lives, then all of who we are needs to boast about Christ. We can't sing Our God Reigns on Sundays and then live stressed out as if our wallets and our jobs reigned from Monday to Saturday. Now, I don't have a crazy testimony like the Apostle Paul. I've been a Christian all my life, but I did have to respond to God with my life. I had to say, all right, there's going to come a time where I have to make a decision. Am I going to live for Christ or am I going to live for myself? And it was at that point that I moved from Arizona to here, to Paramount, to serve and to be equipped to become a pastor. 
Now your life is very different than mine. What, what's your testimony? What are the things that you are gonna have to do to change uh, your life around a little bit to actually reflect that Christ is better? Maybe it doesn't mean that you're gonna leave your job or move out of state or do something, but how is your life going to reflect that Christ is better? And how are you gonna help others see that? So would you take some time to reflect on that right now? Well, thank you for taking some time to reflect. And I want to encourage you with this. The Apostle Paul in ver- uh, verse 12, he says, Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So rest assured that Christ has taken a hold of you. Christ has found each and every one of us and has brought us to be his people. Now, through the Holy Spirit, we can also serve and give the glory to His name. So I encourage you to press on and proclaim that Christ is better, better than anything that we can do and better than anything that this world can offer. Would you place your hands like this so I can give you a benediction from Colossians 1. As we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of His people in the kingdom of light. Be blessed. Thank you for joining us. Let us know that you are worshiping with us by filling out the friendship folder. You can find the link in the video description. You can also sign in by texting us at text at erc.la. Have a blessed week. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here be.